the gospel are aptly suited to continue our discussion of the insane. We already said that it's a type of insanity to not see reality the way it is. It's another type of insanity to not treat reality the way it is. Is our Lord telling us to go out and do dishonest things, to win the friendship of the world? Hardly. His point is that the pagans, the worldlings, are more serious about their goals than we appear to be about ours. And the funny thing is, they're working for something that isn't real. It's passing. The insanity that most of us suffer from is that we're too concerned about suffering. We think just because we suffer, somehow that means we're unhappy. That might require some explanation. We know that the moral life consists essentially in loving God. And if we've noticed anything at all about life, it's that loving God is not easy. And as a result, we're going to suffer. Mostly what we suffer is trying to conquer sin, trying to overcome our fallen human nature, which is always leading us to things we shouldn't be doing. But the whole point of the spiritual life is not this suffering it's the loving. The struggle against sin and its effects is a natural result of our love for God and God's love for us. And the struggle and the suffering are necessary for our love to grow. Whatever the cause of our suffering, too often we get so tied up with it that we forget it's really about loving God. So we should look at two things then. What is love? And why does it involve suffering? What is love? The old Catholic encyclopedia follows St. Thomas on this point. Love is an act of the will, although at times it's intensely emotional and frequently impacts our senses, love is in the will, and thus something that we are free to do or not do. Otherwise, our Lord could not have commanded it of us. Well, if love is an act, then it must mean doing something. Actions are about doing things. What is it that we do, then, when we love? Two things. If we love someone, we wish what is best for them. And the second thing we do is we wish to be united to them, to be with them. So first, wishing what is truly best for someone. That's a mark of true love. What is best? We say a thing is good, better, or best depending on how well it lives up to what it was made for. So if a man is made to be with God, then the closer that man gets to God, the better he is. If someone's actually united to God, then that man is the best that he can be. He has achieved what he was made for. He's perfect. True love means then wishing what is best, not merely what's good. The second act of love is obvious. We wish to be united to the one we love. Doesn't need much explanation. The logical outcome of those two things, though, is that we're naturally going to want to make ourselves the best that we can be for the one we love. If we know we're no good, then we shouldn't want to be united to the one we love because 
that's not wishing what's best for them. Just a quick side note about loving our enemies. Wishing that our enemies get to heaven and wishing that we get to heaven is in fact wishing to be united to our enemies. We will be united in the beatific vision. Wishing what's best for our enemies, we can kind of make ourselves do that. Okay, I want him to get to heaven. But wishing to be united to him can be difficult. Union in the beatific vision is in fact union with our enemies. And then consequently we're logically going to be moved to do what's best for getting our enemies to heaven. Sometimes that's simply praying. But getting back on track, let's review. We saw the three things that true love is about. Wishing what is best for the beloved, wishing union for the one we love, and perfecting ourselves for the sake of the one we love. Okay, now let's apply this to loving God. Loving God means wishing what's best for God, wishing to be with God, and trying to make ourselves perfect for God. Well, what is best for God? Well, obviously, God is the best thing for God. So we glory in that, we delight, and we praise him for that. But apart from that, the glory of God is the greatest created good in the universe. Now God himself, we said, is the greatest good. And the glory he gives himself is perfect and far above any glory that any creatures can give him. But given that it can be only one God, the next greatest good is the glory given to God by his creation. That's why we're created, the glory of God. So if we love God, we wish to give him glory. We also then would want to see him loved by others because that will yet again increase his glory. So love of God and the glory of God, that's what we mean when we say we wish the best for God. The second part of loving God, after we're wishing the best, then we wish to be united to God. Well, again, that's sort of obvious. Of course we want to be united to God. It's also what's best for us. It's the only thing that's going to make us truly happy. There is such a thing as a good and holy self-love, and that is wishing what is truly best for ourselves to be with God. If we wish what's best for God and we wish to be with God, then we must also wish to make ourselves perfect for God. That is, free from all stain of sin and thus pleasing to God. Well, that covers the first topic. What is love? Love is wishing what is truly best for someone, wishing to be united to them, and wishing to make ourselves perfect for them. In relationship to God, it means wishing that he be worthily glorified, wishing to be united to him, and wishing to be sinless in order to please him. Okay, why does that mean we have to suffer? Well, we know that we have to suffer. Love often moves us to suffering. Think of the things we do each and every day for love of our family. They're not necessarily easy things. But sometimes, in relationship to loving God, we focus so much on the suffering that we forget about the loving. If this happens in our natural relationships, we can see how that turns one very bitter and resentful toward the ones we're supposed to love. St. Teresa of Avila even made the observation, God, if this is how you treat your friends, is it any wonder you have so few of them? People who get too concerned about the suffering and miss the point, the love. First, loving God means that we want the best for God. We want to give God glory. That's what's best for him. Not that he needs us, 
but that's the way he's arranged things. I suppose if it were easy to give God glory, we wouldn't have to suffer at all. But because of original sin, it's not easy to glorify God. There's disorder in the universe. And so giving glory to God means that we have to overcome ourselves. We have to die to ourselves. Otherwise, we end up glorifying ourselves in the place of God. We'll serve ourselves instead of serving God. How right the devil was when he told Eve, you shall be like gods. We often are tempted to hold God's place in our own lives. Overcoming ourselves means suffering. It's a struggle to say no to our own wants and our desires. We all know that. To honor God means at the very least then to overcome ourselves. At least that much suffering we know. But more than just overcoming ourselves, so that we can glorify God and not ourselves. We want to make sure that God is loved and glorified always and everywhere and by everyone. That would be giving God the greatest possible glory. Remember, we love him. We want what's best for him. Not just from ourselves, but best for him. But that's not happening either. Most men, most of the time, prefer to love and glorify themselves. Okay, so why does that mean that we have to suffer? We still want what's best for God, and he's not getting it. What can we do about that? We can repay the glory and the love that God is not getting from others. We call this atonement. Repairing the damage done by sin, restoring God's glory, giving him the love that is due to him, but stolen by men. Love does not care that we didn't do the stealing, though, of course, we've all done our part. It only cares that God gets what's best. Love is selfless. Now, we know that God's worthy of infinite glory, and we can never repay that. So is it any wonder that some people suffer so much when they themselves are practically sinless? They love God so much that there's nothing they wouldn't do. There's nothing they wouldn't suffer to give him the love he deserves. Okay, a quick review again. If we want what's best for God, then we're going to suffer because giving glory to God is not easy in our fallen state. And because there's a lot of atonement to be offered, there's a lot of sin to be made up for, we're going to have to suffer. The second act of love is wishing that we were united to God, one with him. Why does that mean we have to suffer? Well, quite simply, because we're tied up in the things of this world. We have natural loves, things in this world that are painful to give up. Original sin makes us more attached to the things of the world than we ought to be. So to say no to them, as well as saying no to ourselves, can be very difficult and painful. So if we want to be with God, we're going to suffer by separating ourselves from these lesser and imperfect loves. God says we must love him above all other things, wife, family, and home, and country. Does that mean we have to have a greater feeling of love for God? No. But it means that the love of God has to take first place. Finally, 
Love means that we want to make ourselves perfect for the one we love. And quite simply, that means suffering because we're not worthy to stand before God. We've all sinned. And sin is rooted in pride, and pride is an inordinate desire for our own excellence. In order to atone for sin, then, pride must be crushed. We must give up ourselves where before we preferred ourselves. We must suffer if we wish to be perfect for God. And here's where we see the love that God has for us. He offers us suffering because he loves us. He wants what's best for us. And heaven is obviously the best thing for us. But we can't get there if we're proud, if we're full of sin. And so he sends us suffering to purify us, to humble us, to give us a chance to atone for sin. If we suffer more, it's because God loves us more. And now we see where suffering really fits in. Too often we focus on the suffering and not the love. But suffering is a sign of love. We suffer because we love God and God loves us. The devil would rather have us focus on the negative, on the sins, on the suffering, even the efforts to overcome the sins. And we do need to suffer, to convert, to do penance, to atone for sin. But the goal, the reason we do those things, the very reason we exist, is love. And that is what God would rather we focused on. If we see reality the way it really is, then we see all things in the light of love. And we do all things for love. Does it change the fact that we're going to suffer? No. But to suffer for love is pure joy. There's no sorrow or sadness, but only love. And the greatest suffering will be to know that no suffering can ever be enough to save every soul, for some souls will always refuse love. The one love that was sufficient to save them, they still reject. Oh, if only we could love enough to win that heart to the love of God. What would love not suffer or endure or even embrace for that? Look how much he loves us. Is there anything we wouldn't suffer for love of him? Is there any suffering that's not a complete joy if we love God? And that is the way reality really is. Pray, read the Bible, receive the sacraments, read the lives of the saints. Because we can't love God if we don't know God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen.